Hi everyone, I'm Nick Marchuk and I will be the professor for ME433 Advanced Mechatronics. I don't have my fancy uh, glass whiteboard ready yet, but um, we'll have that for future videos. For today, we don't have our lab kits either, so I'm going to give a quick lecture on uh, digital filtering. And unfortunately, you have to listen to all the background noises in my backyard, <laughs> but we'll try to get through this. So, our discussion today is digital filtering. Um, we will be using this later in the course once we have our microcontroller set up and we're grabbing data and we want to make it smoother. So have we done this in the past? In the past we've had analog signals, which meant we had some kind of like voltage versus time. So we were sampling voltages uh, coming from some kind of uh, sensor. And um, if we had a nice smooth signal, we'd be happy, but inevitably there's some kind of high frequency noise on top of our signal. So that could be uh, noise from our power supply, it could be um, the actual signal we're measuring is noisy, just lots of different reasons why we might have noise. How do we get rid of that noise on the analog voltage? Well, we would put this into a filter uh, of maybe one resistor and one capacitor, called an RC low pass filter, and we have an input and an output. And this has a cutoff frequency, which we'll talk more about, um, of 1 over 2 pi RC. What does that mean? That means that this um, filter has a frequency response curve for this simple low pass filter. It kind of looks like this, where this is the magnitude of the signal that gets out versus the frequency of the signal that's coming in. So our signal here is composed of a few different frequencies. We've got the, the low uh, frequency we were interested in, we've got high frequency noise on top of it, and the mean is not zero. So the mean is a zero hertz component to our signal. So that means that this RC filter will take all of those individual frequency components, multiply it by essentially this gain that is frequency dependent, and hopefully we can choose it so that the high frequency component is over here and it gets attenuated or made smaller. And then the frequencies that we liked, this low frequency and the mean, the mean would be over here and the low frequency would be maybe over here, they would be kept because their gain is high. Um, so after filtering that voltage versus time curve, hopefully we end up something like that. If we could somehow choose the cutoff frequency, one over two pi RC to be, uh, uh, far enough away from the, th the frequency we're interested in, but uh, also far away from the frequency we're trying to remove. Now, we don't always have the option to build an RC filter. Maybe we're getting data from something that's inherently digital. We're getting data from an accelerometer, and most accelerometers these days, they don't output a voltage, they give you a number. So we can't put a digital number into an RC filter like this. We have to do it digitally. Also, the shape of this curve isn't what we call particularly sharp. The ideal frequency response curve might look like this. Uh, keep all of those frequencies and then keep none of the frequencies above the cutoff frequency. So when we talk about sharpness, it's like, what is the slope of this curve here? For an RC filter, it probably looks like that. So we're keeping a little bit of all of these frequencies and it's hard to say, keep a frequency here and remove a frequency there because it's just not sharp enough. So with more R's and C's and op amps, we could build uh, better and better um, uh, frequency response curves, but those are expensive and hard to build, and they don't work with inherently digital data. So let's figure out how do we uh, do digital filtering, and what are some of the pros and cons. So uh, let's switch to digital filtering. Now this, of course, is a huge topic. There are whole classes on digital signal processing, so I don't want to try to teach you all the math behind everything that's going on here. Uh, we're just going to do the bare minimum so that we know how to use the filters and pick them for, say, performance. Um, the first one we'll talk about is the moving average. So what does a moving average look like? Uh, we're going to say that we have some signal and we're sampling it digitally, so we've got data points, discrete data points at fixed time intervals, dt, and 
as the data is coming in, the data point is coming in one at a time, we want to filter the data. So we're not going to collect all the data and then post-process it. There are other techniques for that. This would be like a live moving average. So I'll call this the live filter. So we will choose how many data points do we want to average as we're going. Let's say we take three. So we'll wait until we have three data points, the first three collected, and then we will average those three. So uh, when we average those three, it's kind of like that number. And for the, the value of the current time period, which is uh, here, we'll save the average. Now we'll wait one period DT. And now the most recent three data points are those three. And we'll take the average. The average is like there. At the next time step, now the three data points we have are those three. And we'll take the average in that, something like that. And now the next data point comes in and the most recent three data points are those three, and the average is something like that. So um, what we can see here is that we have to wait at least uh, the number of data points that we're averaging over before we can start providing a filtered version. Um, or we could kind of pre-populate with zeros if we're going to assume that we want to take an average here. We'll uh, assume that the data is zero before all that. Um, and the more number of data points, the smoother we're going to get but also the more lag, and you can already see that uh, here, the more data points we try to average over, the more lag there will be. So uh, let's try to write that down. More uh, data points equals smoother and more lag from when did something change to when could you detect that it had changed. A uh, very classic way to uh, get some information about how well our filters work is to put a step input into the filter. So my input is going to be zero for a while, and then at some point I will go up to uh, probably like one or something. So what does the filter do? Well, it's taking these discrete data points. And if we said take uh, the three most recent data points and average them, well, the first three, the average would be there, you know, zero. The next three, the average is zero. The next three, uh, the average is one third. And then the next three, the average is two thirds. And then the next three, the average is one. And then the next three, <laughs> the average is one. So we can see that the step response has uh, kind of a linear rise to the final value, just depending on how many uh, data points we're averaging over. And so you can again see the more data points we have, the kind of the smoother we're going to make this sharp edge, so we're smoothing out high frequencies, um, but we're adding lag. So um, that's conceptually, I think, the easiest filter to think about. Uh, in code, as the data comes in, you're going to say that the, uh, um, the average uh, at position i is going to be equal to the sum from, uh, let's say, j equals um, i to um, i minus n of the data. So we have some kind of looping structure that says, um, I've got an array of data, and let me sum over the past three data points. So I've got uh, uh, data of 0, and I've got data of 1. I've got data of two, and I've got data of three, and I'm storing the data as it comes and I'm putting them in an array. When I get data of three, I'm going to average data one through three. When I got data of two, I was averaging zero through there. When I got data of one, well, I didn't have a data of negative one, so maybe I pre-populated a zero in there, or I didn't take the average until I got at least three data. Okay, so that's the moving average filter. Let's talk about another filter that adds, has a little bit less math. And that will be the, um, the infinite impulse response filter. Um. Okay, or uh, as it's usually called, IIR. So an IIR filter is very similar to an RC filter. So the response to the step on the IIR is going to be some kind of RC curve, and it's never really going to get to the final value, kind of like an RC filter really never gets to the final value. Um, and the way we implement the IIR is by saying that the filtered output
is going to be equal to the previous filtered output times some number called A plus the new data times some number called B. And the rule is that A plus B is equal to one. Now what we get to do is we get to choose um, what is A and what is B? Just like on the moving average filter, we, cho we chose how many data points to average, A and B are now our inputs to the filter. And um, you can think of A as how much do you trust the old data, and B is how much do you trust the new data. So if you don't think there's any noise on the signal, well, you would have A be zero and B would be one, and you just say, well, my output is the same thing as my input. I just trust exactly the data as it comes in. But if that data has a little bit of noise, you might say, oh, I'm only going to use 90% of my new data, and I'll use 10% of my old data. And if you really don't trust anything, maybe you trust 90% of the old data and only 10% of the new data. So as B gets um, bigger and bigger, the, this frequency response gets faster, and as A is bigger, it gets slower. So this has the advantage of there's not a whole lot of math to do, right? We're just multiplying two constants and summing. Whereas the moving average filter, if we wanted to average, say, 10 data points, um, we've got, got to sum the previous 10, so we have to remember at least 10 data points, and then we have to divide by 10. Uh, a little bit more math on the moving average filter, so the IIR is kind of a convenient, very kind of quick and dirty um, filter. We don't really know what A and B should be, so we have to have some data to practice on uh, before using it. So what if we wanted a better system? So the moving average filter, you don't know how many uh, number of data points you should act on. The IIR, you don't know what A and B should be. Isn't there a way that we can have an equation, just like for the RC filter, we can have, um, you know, I could say I have a cutoff frequency of, you know, 10 hertz or something, and I would like to design a filter around that. So that's where the uh, finite impulse um, filter comes in. So this is known as the FIR. So the FIR is actually a bigger version of the MAF. The MIF is an FIR filter, just that um, it simplifies some of the math. So an FIR filter is going to say that the output of my filter, my filtered output, um, at timestamp i is going to be equal to some coefficient zero times my data that I just collected, i, plus uh, another coefficient times my data of, uh, oops, data of i minus one, plus another coefficient, coefficient two, times data of i minus two, and so on for the number of data points that I'm uh, operating over. So I'll have, if I'm gonna use 10 data points, I'll have 10 coefficients, and the sum of my coefficients is going to be equal to one, and if I was doing a moving average filter, all the coefficients would be the same, because I would say if I had 10 filters, all of the coefficients would be 1 over 10. So I'd sum all of my data points, divide by 10. Same thing as saying data 1 over 10 plus data 2 over 10 plus data 3 over 10, so on. So um, somehow I can generate these coefficients such that they all sum to 1, and I get to choose what my uh, cutoff frequency will be. Um, we're not going to go over how to do that math. Instead, we'll use a program. Um, for instance, there are functions in MATLAB that do this, um, or we're going to use a website that generates it that really just uses Python um, to generate uh, the C coefficients. And the, as long as they're generating them, they'll show us a frequency response curve. So let's take a look at um, some data that I've processed. Um, we're using this uh, FIIR exclamation point website from, I don't know who Tom Rolance is, but uh, he did a, a nice job with this little website. Um, and we get to choose the type of filter that we're going to be using. Uh, we're going to tell it the sampling rate of our data. And then we, uh, for this moving average filter, we'll say, how many samples do we want to average over? So um, uh, I chose five just to start out with. And here we see a frequency response curve. Uh, it goes up to 200 hertz because that's the Nyquist frequency. That's half of your sample rate. So 
um, on this kind of uh, data, you can't tell frequencies higher than the Nyquist frequency, so um, we can only really see what's happening up to half of our sample rate. And this is uh, a linear linear scale, so we can see that low frequencies um, are being given a gain of one, so they come straight through, but higher frequencies will be attenuated. And in this case, most of them are, will be reduced by at least 50%, and some of them, if for some kind of strange reason, um, get really knocked out. So this specific frequency, whatever, 80 hertz, no 80 hertz component will come out. Um, but for some reason, a little higher at 120 hertz, that frequency will still come out. And here's the same data again, but on a uh, log plot. And usually we look at the log plot because we don't, it doesn't make it look like they actually go to zero. It's, instead, we can tell that, okay, at minus 50 dB, you're down you know, a factor of 10,000. So that those frequencies get really squashed. Um, and we get to see what does an impulse response and step response look like. And it generates the uh, coefficients that we need. Um, in this case, they're all the same because this is a moving average filter. And that's what we multiply our data by. So here I have simulated that. I've taken uh, the data I gave you in GitHub. This came from a pulse oximeter that I built in a previous course. And the blue data is the raw voltage that the N-scope collected from my filter. So I sit there with my finger on the sensor, and every time we see a pulse here, that's a heartbeat. But, you know, it's noisy, um, and it drifts, and we've got all kinds of data issues. So um, this is the red, is the output of a five um, data point moving average filter. And if we could zoom in all the way on the left here, we'd see that it doesn't start. The, so the first four data points I skip um, because I don't have the full five yet. So on the fifth data point of the blue one, that's my first data point on the red one. And I just do, I just average the previous uh, five data points, and that's the data point that I save. And you can see there's not really any discernible lag, and it's definitely smoother. Here I plot just the output, and, and you can see there's still a little bit of fuzz on top of the output. And the bottom part, this is the FFT. So the FFT says, let me show you what are the magnitudes of every frequency in the data you collect. And it goes to uh, 200 hertz here, because that's the Nyquist frequency when I sampled at 400 hertz. The blue represents the raw data. And you can see that the red matches the blue data up until some frequency. It looks like 30 hertz. And at that point, the red, uh, the content of the uh, filtered data at higher frequencies, higher than, say, 20 hertz, their magnitudes are reduced versus the blue one. And that's why the red one looks smoother, because it contains less high frequency data. So that was five data points in a moving average filter. Let's see what happens when we add more data points. So here I'll do 30 data points. The downside to doing 30 data points is you have to remember all 30 previous data points. Um, and then there's some floating point math to do, which is particularly slow on a microcontroller. But look at the much better response we get. Now we have um, uh, much more squashed higher frequencies. The cutoff frequency here looks like, uh, let's see, that's 25 hertz, so like 12 hertz. This cutoff frequency, which is usually when you think of uh, minus 3 dB on this graph, um, is probably more like 50 hertz. So by using six times the amount of data, I can reduce my cutoff frequency, um, what is that, by a factor of two or three. So um, here's the response now. Um, we can see the red one's much smoother, and on the FFT, definitely much smoother. Um, but there's a little bit of lag. See how the red one's just a little bit uh, behind the blue one? Because now taking at least 30 data points, know that something's happened. Um, other things we can tell here, Here's a peak in the blue that is roughly at 60 hertz. That's very common when you're using analog signals in the US because our electrical grid is running at 60 hertz, so we just have this huge amount of 60 hertz noise going on. And then here's another peak at like 120. Um, all the harmonics of 60 will have noise on them. Um, and so look at this. We, we were able to reduce all of the frequencies, but the, the 60 hertz still comes through because we're kind of, uh, if we look at the frequency response curve at 120 hertz, um, there's still a little bit of it coming through. And we can see that on the red one a little wavy. So let's try to do better. Um, I didn't simulate the IIR, but let's look at the response of an FIR. So uh, an FIR low pass filter, uh, sampling at 40 hertz, I get to choose a cutoff frequency, and I get to choose a bandwidth. This particular website doesn't let you choose the number of data points um, that you're going to be averaging over. Instead, it tells you. so. Uh, not as useful as some other websites that do this, where you can say, I want to do this over 10 data points. Um, but if I said I wanted to filter at 12 uh, hertz, and a bandwidth saying, I'm willing to let the slope go down to like, whatever this is, 80 hertz here, where that red line is, 
so I can get this shape for my cutoff frequency. And now I get all my coefficients. And they're strange. Some of them are negative. They all sum to 1. Um, and we can see this kind of weird frequency response over 15 coefficients. Is probably, you know, the same smoothness, but less lag than the moving average filter did at 30 data points. Um, and we cut, we did a cutoff frequency of 12 hertz, so we can look at the FFT at, let's see, here's um, 1, here's 10, so here's 12 hertz is somewhere around here. Um, and you can see that's where the red signal suddenly gets much smoother than the blue. We've completely knocked out the 120 hertz. There's still a little bit of 60 hertz coming through. Let's see if we can do better. Here's um, uh, 12 hertz, same exact color frequency as before, but I reduced the bandwidth. So I'm basically saying I want this slope to be sharper. I want a sharper cutoff frequency. And this, in this case, it needs 67 coefficients. So the penalty for trying to get a sharp cutoff frequency is that we have to save more data and do more math. Um, but look how smooth it is when it comes out. And we'll really tell by looking at the uh, FFT, 60 hertz here. There's no more 60 hertz. There's no more 120 hertz. There really is no data really past 12 hertz where I asked it to put the, the cutoff frequency. But the downside, because we had to use 67 coefficients, is that we've got a little bit of lag. OK, let's keep going. Um, both of the previous uh, FIRs, I was using a Blackman style window. So um, in DSP, you could talk about the different kinds of window types. Here I'm using Kaiser, which gives us an even sharper cutoff frequency. And um, I asked it to do a uh, really low cutoff, really sharp, so 135 coefficients. A lot of data has to be stored. A lot of math has to be done. But look how smooth the data is, at, as well as with a lot of lag. And we really got the smooth FFT. So this is the advantage of doing a digital filter. Um, if you have uh, the time and, and efficiency on the microcontroller to do all that math and store all the data, you can get a very smooth curve. You don't have to buy resistors and capacitors and op amps. Um, you can very easily change how the filter responds by changing the code, which is essentially free. Um, but we do have to deal with lag, but really any filter is going to have lag. So uh, you just have to think about how does that lag hurt your performance and then balance the lag versus the level of noise you're willing to tolerate. Uh, one more quick thing. Um, we don't have to do just low pass filters. Here's a band pass filter. And the band pass filter means I have a high pass and a low pass filter because this particular data, as I moved around, kind of drifted at a very low frequency. So I can use the high pass portion of this band pass filter to remove really, really low frequencies to try to get a mean of zero. So here I picked four hertz as my high pass, 12 hertz as my low pass. And when you look at the red line, it's really squashed. Well, you just basically got rid of all of the data. But if I don't plot them on top of each other, here is the band pass signal. And we can see a very sharp peak at every heartbeat that I had. And this is pretty independent of whether I'm kind of moving around. So you can imagine on your um, smartwatch that has um, some kind of uh, infrared sensor on it that's counting your pulse, this is what they're doing. They're taking that data, which is pretty noisy and bouncing around at low frequencies and at high frequencies. They're doing a bandpass filter to isolate just the signal where your heartbeat probably is, between 1 and 5 hertz. Um, and they're getting it as sharp as they can. And then they're just counting the number of peaks over a certain time period to get your beats per minute of your heart rate. Um, and here we can see the FFT of the data. So the high pass filter really removed the very low frequencies. The low pass filter removed all the high frequencies. And I'm just left with this band between, in this case, 1 and 20 hertz to see my heartbeat data. And then I did it again, trying to get it even more narrow. This is a band pass filter from 1 hertz to 10 hertz. And it's a little bit smoother than the previous one. So all kinds of cool stuff happens there. OK, so see if you can take the uh, four different signals that I gave you on GitHub, write some Python code to filter them, uh, make these graphs. Note that there's a lot of ways to do this in Python. There's actually convolution functions that would probably do this in one line of code. Um, but you could think about this as something you'll have to eventually implement in C. So think about it as the data is coming in. Um, remember the previous X number of data points. Multiply them by their weights. Sum them and then save them. And then plot them on top of each other and generate the FFT to prove that the weights that you picked um, have the cutoff frequencies that you thought they did. Okay, I'll see you soon. Um, hopefully back on the normal screen with the glass.